Uh, I was at an entrepreneur summit in the Gold Coast uh, a week or so ago, um, a couple weeks ago, and I heard one of the uh, presenters talk about something, and as he talked about it, I was like, this is actually really relevant, really good. It poses a lot of questions with like modern psychology and that sort of thing. However, when I looked at this presentation that he gave, I was like, oh, man, as, as if you can see this and not see just a complete subtext of God throughout the whole thing. And so that's what I wanted to do this morning. So I came back from it, and normally I wait for Dad to say to me, would you like to preach again? It happens probably once a year. Um, and I turn around and I was like, you know what? Dad, I want to talk about something. Because I think it is really something really cool. And, and I'm quite passionate about what I do. And so what, what I now do um, is I work in uh, personal development uh, primarily. And what I love doing is finding the connections between how people relate personal development, it's very much uh, they're getting in like in tune with like the universe or something like that. And I love taking that and during out of it, actually, you know what, this is just, you're saying universe, I'm saying God, I'm just giving him a name because you're still believing in a higher power. And and I love showing how everything that is kind of personal development is actually also underpinning like what we should be doing as Christians as well. Um, so I just want to I, I want to go through that. So first slide up, Gregorio. Uh, today we're going to be chatting about emotional awareness versus spiritual intelligence, um, and what that looks like in kind of like the modern day society, and then also as we apply that into our lives as Christians as well. So, what the current, let's go slide two. Yes. <laughs> so, oh, you may not be able to read it. I could read it on my computer at home. Uh, so, broadly defined, emotional intelligence is our ability to recognize, understand, and manage our own emotions, while also being sensitive and responsive to the emotions of others. It's a set of skills that allow us to navigate the ebbs and flows of life with grace and understanding. And so, people love to feel emotional. It, it is something that you feel every single day. And when you have a negative emotion, that's really frustrating. Frustrating, negative emotion. You don't like feeling the negative of stuff. Everyone like, desires to be positive and to have like a high energy and everything, but there is like negative emotions attached into that as well. It's called life. That's ha that happens. Now, there is a psychological way to be able to rewire your brain to be like, hey, look, let's not think negatively and just think positively. Mm, that's cool, but that's not what we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on why God puts that there and what the reasons for those emotions are. Slide three. The problem, while the Bible doesn't mention emotional intelligence by name, it is full of wisdom and guidance on these five elements. While many see the existence of emotional awareness, EA, I tried to go like EA, I, AI, SI. As a factor of modern psychology, I'm aiming to show how we use it as a divine instrument that gives that is given to us by God to become more like Him. So, what happens is there's an axis, A X I S, goes up and down, side to side. George, I mean Greg, number three, number four, sorry. And it might be a bit hard to read here, but it actually, actually says first, their way. And so this is looking at like what the world sees as how to be 
like emotionally aware and emotionally regulating yourself. High energy, low energy, negative motion, and positive motion. And so at the top right hand side, a negative emotion that's high energy is anger. Angry. Everyone's angry all the time. You know why? Because the opposite of that is passionate and determined. And so everyone is either passionate or determined or angry about something. Because if you're not angry, then you've got drive and you've got like reason and meaning. And so you're like, cool, actually, that's if you've got high energy. Yeah. And so then the opposite inflection of that is low energy and positive emotions, which is grateful and appreciation. You can really do that just being calm. I'm really grateful about this. So I've got a lot of appreciation for this, this, and this. It doesn't really require much to be thankful about things. However, the negative of the low energy is bored and, and depressed and and the world likes to put labels and reasons onto these emotions. So the world likes to look at emotions that aren't good because the world thinks you should always be happy. Isn't that the dream? Like everyone should be going for success and happiness and that's it. However, you shouldn't be feeling you shouldn't be feeling like this. And there's a reason why you've done something wrong or something is out to get you. Uh, it's just your mindset. You've got to change it. That's not true. Being depressed, being bored, being scared or being angry are emotions that God puts in our way, in our path, to be able to bring the focus point, the microscope, Microscope? Yeah, magnifying glass back to him on every situation in our life. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. History, isn't it? It's good. As followers of Christ, we believe in a God who is deeply emotional. And so that doesn't just mean that he is deeply joyful. He is everything all at once. A God who loves who shows compassion, who rejoices and grieves. And we are created in his image, and therefore it includes being created with a capacity for emotion as well. Our ability to use, understand, and manage these emotions in a way that is consistent with God's will um, is all part of his plan, purpose, and actual like moral law that he gives in inherently to everyone because you don't you don't get born without emotion. And so it's something that you don't necessarily learn how to cry the first time. It's a need, it's a want, it's a yearning for something, and so you're automatically you have that straight away from the very first Breath, but even even babies have emotions. Like inside, they kick you. What do you want? Food. Okay, all right, I'll eat. Um, I don't know that feeling. I'm not a mum, <laughs> but I'm gathering it's a bit of the same. So something I'd like to take a look at is uh, a verse that we're probably all real familiar with. Um, Galatians five, twenty-two to twenty-three, and. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These aren't like abstract ideas. These are all emotions or outputtings of emotions that can actually fit into this graph, all we've got to do is take the words that the world's put on it and add the ones that God puts on it. So next slide please, Greg. Oh, okay, cool. Yep, we're going to shift the ideology of the world into Holy Spirit and God stuff. Next one. 
Cool. The positive inflection of angry that determined self-control. Another word for passion is akin to joyfulness. Uh, you can stick patience and faithfulness in high energy and positive emotion and then the low energy being kindness, gentleness, thankfulness and peace. Appreciation, thankfulness. And there was something, there was another one in there, which was peace. Now, if you presented this to people outside of the church, people were like, oh yeah, that's awesome, but that's not attainable because half the people, you're still feeling emotions that are on the opposite side. And what the definitions of the negative emotions are, if you want to jump again, Greg, is Next slide, Greg. The next, the next slide goes into, um, it goes abbreviate, there we go. So, being depressed is actually just uh, for the majority of cases, because I'm not a doctor, is actually just not having like, purpose or meaning. You just don't know what to do. You don't want to get out of the bed in the morning because you don't have a reason to. Uh, being bored is having no direction or connection. Being lonely. Uh, you don't have that. You just, I don't have anything to do. And that is also the absence of that passion and that anger as well, of that emotion. Being scared. Being scared is great because people put it under so many different titles as like insecure or anxious uh, or fear. I love this one. People say, I have anxiety. And I say, okay, cool. Actually, you're just scared of something. The reality is, you're just scared. If you've got anxiety about, about going into populated areas, you don't have anxiety about the area. You're, you're scared of being seen and around people. If you're, if you've got anxiety about uh, going up and singing in front of the church, you're not actually, you're not actually, you don't, you're not actually anxious about that. You're scared that that there might be a spirit of like judgment, or you might not be able to do something right, or you might get the words wrong, or you might sing the wrong note, and all of that adds into this feeling of uncertainness, and you're like, oh, let's just put that all into one word, and let's just call it anxiety. All of these areas are actually something really cool. Oh, now I'll talk about anger as well. So angry, the emotion of angry is actually just the rise of your ego. Uh, I was reading a book by Daniel Priestley, who uh, speaks about how to connect people. And he was talking about the fact that ego is not actually what we think of it in regards to like this big, this big like chested man that comes up when you're like, oh yes, I can lift more weight than you and I'm going to show you how good I am. But ego, much rather, is just the conflict of your, of something that you hold of more value than somebody else does. And it's the meeting of those. So I like coffee uh, from Colombia. Dad likes coffee from the Amazon. Ethiopia. Okay? So Dad says, Ethi Ethiopian coffee is the best. <laughs> no, it's not. Do you know? Have you ever had Colombian coffee? And you have, yes. <laughs> Isn't that it? Now, all it is, is something that you value really highly is being met at by someone who doesn't value it as highly as you do. And so then you turn around and you get defensive about that. What's a word that we can call that for? We just call that ego. 
but ego's got so much negative connotations to it. However, when you understand it right, it's actually just something that you're passionate about, something that you value, meeting someone that doesn't hold that same. And what you get to do then, if you're not having an egotistical conversation, is discuss why there's a conflict of values, if you understand that mind difference. And the reason why I'm chatting about that is because often people get angry. Who gets angry? Okay. Who gets angry? Yeah, yeah we all get angry. But it's like, we all do. Everyone gets angry at some point. You can be, and we don't just get angry at the person who cuts us off in traffic. We get right alongside them and look at them as well. As if that stare wasn't enough. We then just go. It's like, because I, I value. And that, that, that brings up emotion in you. You get angry, like, oh, and frustrated and everything. And in that moment, what you have is you actually have an opportunity. Greg, next slide. <laughs> You're just scared of getting it wrong. <laughs> So, in each of these situations, there is a, not a mindset shift that has to happen, but rather there is an action that needs to be completed in order for someone to move from a negative emotion or a low energy negative emotion into a positive one. You actually have to do something because something that we say a lot, is nothing changes if nothing changes. And so the definition of insanity is doing the exact same thing every single day and expecting a different result. So you need to make a change to go from being bored to being thankful. And people will tell you it's a mindset shift. And I'm going to stir the pot a little bit. Okay. In a good way, in a biblical way. Next slide, please. So, this is an axis, but a bit different. The way, there is no parts of the cross that are bad. When I saw the axis, I just saw a cross. And I was like, you know what? There's a reason why he can't put this in any other way except on an axis. Because there is no other way that you can move from a negative to a positive without the cross. Every single thing, scenario, theory, study we have in life can always point to Jesus. So what happens is someone has to look for a deeper understanding and a deeper reason to move from this emotion to the opposite inflection through Christ. They have to see what is what does God call me to in this? If I am angry, how do I get out of this anger? Oh, actually you know what? I need to focus on Jesus. Okay, cool. This is a situation. I'm actually just what I what I see is that I just value this a lot. I'm really passionate about this. And immediately your attitude changes. Because you're not focusing on I hate this, but rather I love this. And so, the one emotion that I haven't actually brought up yet, Greg, is Greg. Now, the one emotion that I haven't brought up yet, yeah, he's on the ball today, I like it. No, you're going the opposite way. The, the other way back? If you just press down, there we go. So, this is the one thing. You know what? It says in Galatians 5, love first, because it is the most important. Also, it actually embodies quite a lot of what uh, every single, I like saying subtext, because it's like the message underneath everything. But to be kind, you've got to love. To be gentle, you've got to love. To be thankful, you've got to love. To have peace, you've got to love. 
And the reason why we have to love in order to do that is because we have to put Jesus into everything. And Jesus is love. And so when you look at the cross in the axis, the only way that you can move from negative to positive is through love, and that's through Jesus. And people will never experience the real, authentic, and genuine way of these emotions if they don't actually have Jesus in their life. And so what the enemy likes to do is likes to say to somebody, you know what, you're joyful because of this reason, this reason, this reason, and they actually never feel fully satisfied, and the reason they don't feel satisfied is because they don't have Jesus. So they don't have the underpinning of what the actual root emotion is and therefore will never be satisfied. So you can strive as much as you want for passion, for purpose, for thankfulness. You can, you can strive for gratitude. You can strive for joy and peace and everything. However, if you don't have a relationship with the Creator, then you ain't going to get any of that anyway. It's really good for a moment in time, but that time is temporary. Just like sin. Sin is something temporary that makes you feel great and kills you. Just like the was it the wolf last week that he was talking about. A temporary amount of satisfaction is going to destroy you forever. Oh, oops. Microphone. It's a very expensive one. Dad just gets angry. <laughs> nah, Dad doesn't really get angry. Dad's a very passionate man. Ha! Ah, see what I did there? There is someone that I've never seen spend so much time with Lord than my dad. The other day, walked into the bedroom, walked into his bedroom. No, I didn't walk into the bedroom. I walked into the hallway. I said, what are you doing, Dad? And he was like, he looks up. And he's just sitting on the end of his bed. Just sitting there, though. Not like laying down and relaxing or anything. Just sitting there. And I was like, this is weird. Remember this? Yeah. I have to ask that because he forgets a lot of things these days. <laughs> However, so he's sitting there and he's got his phone in his hand, but the phone's not on. And I said, what are you doing? He's like, I'm just sitting. Like, sitting doing what? He's like, just praying. About what? He's like, about you. <laughs> and I was like, what about me? And he was like, no, not about you, just about everything. And I was like, what do you mean just about everything? He was like, I just, like, you need to, in order to be able to deepen the relationship with God, you need to just, you need to just pray. You don't get to just pray for things. He was like, don't you do that? And I was like, yes. And I was like, I, when I pray, I pray for a reason. I'm like, you know what, I want to feel closer to God, so... I was like, I, I want that. And so I come before him and I'm like, Lord, forgive me for this. Forgive me for this. Forgive me for this. Oh, This is a really good introduction, isn't it? I'm like, Lord, forgive me for this. Forgive me. Or someone wants healing. Lord, like, I just want you to heal this person. Or someone's got a need. Something happens. I'm like, ah, Lord, I just pray for this person. And I just really want you to just be working in their, their life. I don't actually remember a time ever where I've just said, good morning, Lord, and just sat and just waited. And what that is, is it shows actually there's a lot in my life that I need to be asking for. And God does answer those shopping list prayers. You just send the email straight away, he gets it. And he's like, mm-hmm, I'll reply. Or I might delay the send a little bit. I haven't heard from you in three days. What's going on? Sometimes in your emails as well, you get like a, a notification saying you haven't replied to this email in five days. Do you want to follow up? And it can feel like that. It can be like, I haven't really heard anything. Or That's because you're just asking for things all the time. But what you're not asking for is just to grow. It's just to sit and wait and rest and be at peace. And so... That's why I can turn around and if anyone ever asks me, like, tell me about your dad, I'd be like, oh, he's probably one of the most passionate men I know. Anger would never come into it. Lonely. I asked him this week, do you remember this? I said, Dad, are you ever lonely? He said, no. I was like, what about when Sasha leaves? Goes to work for the day. And then you call her half an hour later. He's like, yeah, I call her because I want that connection. 
I don't know. I'm not lonely. She's in my life. And I was like, oh, he didn't know that I was getting information about my sermon. He just thought, Bo's acting weird. Am I lonely? When, <laughs> when you are consistently, constantly in a space where you and Jesus are just one, people won't be able to describe you as something other than what the fruits of the Spirit are. You can take that around. You can, you can change the words from gratefulness to appreciation. However, when the closer you are to Jesus, the more that when people look at you, they just see him as well. And so what happened on the cross, however many years ago, was the initial act of love that God gave that then brought redemption for all of us to be able to have this relationship with with God. And then what it enabled us to do is to be able to start a discipleship slash sanctification process with Christ to be able to take these emotions that we have as people, deeply emotional people, and and find out how he calls us to deal with them. So next slide, Greg. Oh, you definitely can't read that. I can read it for you though. So what the what anger is is an opportunity to trust. The opportunity that's given to you when you're angry is to just trust that God knows better than you and to just let go. It's actually quite a scary thing to do, to let go. However, if you just trust that God's got a situation, you change that whole, sh- you shift the entire perspective and you allow him to be in control. Then he gets into control and he teaches you something. Actually, you're not angry at your kids for doing X, Y, Z. You just love them so much and don't want them to hurt themselves. And so you're like, Ugh, I love them so much. I don't have kids, so I don't know how that feels. However, I've got empathy, which means I can see how other people love them. Like, oh, they love them so much. When you are scared, when you have fear, when you have anxiety, it's actually an opportunity to learn. It's an opportunity to be taught. It's an opportunity to grow. Because if you're scared of something, then it gives you an opportunity to grow that muscle and to learn about how God wants you to overcome that. He doesn't, he doesn't want you to overcome that without Him, though. So it's nice catch-22. I want you to overcome it, but you can't do it without me. Because you have to go through the cross. You have to go through love in order to overcome it. Opportunity to grow. Yeah, that was for, yeah, in boredom. Opportunity to grow. In loneliness, opportunity to grow. When it comes to depression, when it comes to no purpose, no meaning, that's an opportunity to choose to enjoy Jesus and enjoy that relationship. And that's what I picked up from Dead this week. I was like, oh, he's just enjoying Jesus. I was like, man, that's cool. And then what do I have? Envy. <laughs> it's not. Justin Bo's um, the fan. Because uh, I know some of you are going to go home. The only thing you'll remember from this is that Bo doesn't sit there and wait for the <laughs> cigar. For the sake of that, enjoying a relationship. Bo does do that, but he does it in worship. He, you know, he'll hop on the piano or with his guitar. So that does happen. It's not as though he is bereft of having a real relationship. He's, he wants something out of it. <laughs> 
Loved that. That was great. <laughs> Thanks, Dad, for coming to my defense. That was awesome. See that? That's love. That's just like, oh, no, I can't have people thinking wrong about my son. Did you? Comes up. Conflict of values, no conflict here. We don't do that. Mm. So, I will never bring something forward without showing that the way in which to be, to be able to move from one side of life to the other is only through Jesus. And I, I, will never, I will never present or speak about anything to you without that. Because every opportunity to hear about Jesus is a good one. And every opportunity that you have to come to church should be an opportunity to, if you don't know who Jesus is, is to find out who he is and it's how that relationship. Whether or not all of us here are Christians or not, if we all are, we take encouragement from that. But if we're not, even that one person gets the opportunity to be able to... Hey, I want to experience what you guys experience because it, it, it sounds so good. So, Gregorio, next one. Wind it up. It is God who gave in love first. The emotion. He gives in love. What's the first thing he gave? Love. It is God who provided a way for us to decode what emotional awareness is. When people talk to you about, oh, you just need to like emotionally regulate yourself, you're like, no, you don't. You just need Jesus. You don't need to make this a huge long list of things to be like, actually, you know what? This one costs $3,944 and I can get you from turning from anger to joy. It's like, yeah, same. Here's like, I've got, this one is about 66 books long. Have a look at this. And it's free. Most of the time. <laughs> Unless you want one of the really nice printed versions. It is God who provided redemption through Jesus to bring us to reflect him more bringing him glory, praise, and worship. The act of, of changing in yourself with the power of the Holy Spirit because of your relationship with Jesus changes your emotions and it changes how you present yourself. And there are so many verses in the Bible that talk about emotions. Uh, slow to anger. Quick to, uh, so to speak. Oh, it's in my notes, but I forgot. What is it, Dad? Quick. I lost my notes. I haven't even looked at them really. Um, but yeah, there's one that talks about like be be slow to speak, slow to anger, quick to love. Yeah, Jack. Mm. Killed it, James. That's nice. Love your neighbor as yourself. So much emotion. I know there's only three. There's a lot of them. The entire the entire book. Bible is written in emotion. Rejoice in the Lord. So many of them. What happens is, is that we are given an opportunity all the time to reflect God. And as we do that discipleship process with one another and with Jesus, we actually refine that part of ourselves that doesn't look like him into more looking like him and then once we look more like him then we're just like oh you know what like I just love Jesus so much more I am in like this is great I want to worship him more I want to praise him more and everything and then what that does is that grows that relationship with God once more and then what you're doing is you're in this continual personal growth journey to become more like Jesus What's the next slide? People talk about emotional awareness versus... No, well, no one talks about spiritual awareness. This is the first time I've never heard anyone talk about it. I put it into the Google. Google came up with nothing. I was like, what's like, the underpinning of spiritual intelligence versus like, emotional awareness? They were like, brought up some weird stuff. This, uh, no one's talked about it. And I thought, you know what? Actually, I just want to talk about this. Jesus is the underpinning of everything. God is the underpinning of everything. The reason why God is the underpinning of everything is because God was the beginning of everything and so nothing can be created that's not reflective of Him. And so, 
this was kind of like a TED talk for you guys in regards to like emotions. And you can call, you can call each other out on it as well. You can talk to them and be like, oh, how are you this week? Oh, I've been really frustrated. What have you been frustrated about? Like, how can Jesus move in this situation? How can you focus on Jesus in this situation? And then, and that's discipleship right there. Spiritual intelligence really like a relational awareness of your relationship with Jesus is the subtext to all of the theories of the letters A, I, E, I, everything that the world tries to throw at you. And you have the opportunity to whenever you feel something to turn it back to God and use it for something good. Cool? How long did I speak for? Yeah? Is it good? We don't need a clap. <laughs>